welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be introducing Professor John Fitzgerald and Professor Edgar Morgan-Roth. As you all know, um, there has been much discussion of their recent paper on the cost of a united Ireland. Um, and they're here now to summarize that paper and to take your questions and comments. Um, very briefly, um, I will introduce the speakers. John Fitzgerald um, is Honorary Fellow and Adjunct Professor of Economics at Trinity College Dublin. Edgar Morganroth, Professor of Economics, Dublin City University. Um, and John is co-chair of the Economist Group and a member of the UK group here in the IEA, and Edgar also a member of both groups. Um, John Fitzgerald is research affiliate at the ESRI and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. He was a member of the Central Bank of Ireland Commission from 2010 to 2020, and he was chairman of the Irish government's Climate Change Advisory Council until January 2021. Dr. Edgar Morganroth is a member of the Institute of International and European Affairs, Economist Group and UK Group, a full professor of economics at DCU Business School, Dublin City University, and he's held positions at the ESRI, Keele University, and the Strategic Investment Board of Northern Ireland. He's a fellow of the UK Academy of Social Science and a fellow of the Regional Studies Association, having served as its vice chairman and treasurer. So welcome to you both. We're honored to hear you both. John and Edgar will speak to us for about 25 minutes. Then we'll go to Q&A with our audience and with our online audience as well. And I'll remind you, but to just ask your questions concisely and to state your affiliation um, when you are asking questions. The um, discussion today and the questions and answers are on the record. So just a reminder of that. Um, and please feel free to join in on social media with comments and tweets, etc. So over to you, John. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, the, this paper is based on earlier work, which was published in the Journal of the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society in 2020. And we presented it to the Oireachtas Committee in 2021. And we've revised it since in the light of comments. Um, Esmond Burney, a member of the Northern Ireland Fiscal Council, published a paper last autumn with very similar numbers to ours. Um, so, and actually, if you go back, there was a paper by uh, 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 Joe Durkin in, for the New Ireland Forum in the mid 1980s and Brendan Downing in 1974. There's been a long line um, and it with very similar approaches, a long line of research. Um, we're, our work is limited to just looking at the funding of the subvention. We're not, it's based on numbers for 2019. As when Bernie says, the numbers would be bigger if you took today, but we're sticking with 2019 pre COVID. Um, the knock-on effects from the fiscal change in the island are not considered, and much wider economics of effects of unification we don't consider either. So this is a limited study. Um, the transfer within countries is normal. Um, uh, regional solidarity, London transfers to Northern Ireland, Dublin transfers to much of the rest of the country. And what we're here is we're considering the implications for, of transferring the subvention from London to Dublin. So that's what we're doing. Um, I just show here the allocation of public expenditure. It's not that different um, north and south in terms of the shares. Um, uh, we spend more on healthcare than Northern Ireland. Um, surprise, surprise. Um, they spend a lot more on defence, and I'll come back to this. Um, um, uh, uh, and that's not necessarily a surprise either. The subvention to Northern Ireland, I show it going back to 1968, troubled start, and it goes to 20%, and then it was 20%. Uh, for until about 2010. It's been higher, um, a bit higher uh, since um, 2019, actually, it's back down uh, again, and then you see the effects of COVID. So that's that's what we're talking about, how that would be funded in in, in the United Ireland. Um, there are a number of adjustments you've got to make. Um, first of all, corporation tax is too low in Northern Ireland. You've got to add on 300 million because Tesco pay their corporation tax in London, but they make profits in Northern Ireland. So we've made an adjustment for that. On defence, while the Irish army is actually proportionately larger than the British army, which people tend to forget, um, we spend dramatically less on defence. So you'd save a billion, uh, a, a bit over a billion of that subvention, not funding um, the, the uh, uh, much more expensive um, and sophisticated British defence system. Uh, the expenditure and development aid would be a bit higher if you do it in a proportion of population. And of course, there'd be an EU budgetary contribution of 500 million so that there, there, there'd be a net uh, 300 million 
uh, increase there. So we've taken account of these. And in a sense, the debate is uh, uh, our negotiations would be on, would Northern Ireland take a share of the UK national debt, which I'll come back to? Would the UK continue to pay social insurance pensions in Northern Ireland, in spite of the fact that revenue from social insurance would come to Dublin? Would social welfare rates in the North be aligned with Irish rates? And would public service pay rates in Northern Ireland also be aligned? That those are where there's extensive debate and different views. The subvention under United Ireland, I showed the existing subvention in terms of share of Irish national income, 5.8% in 2019. It would be 5.2 when you take account of defence and so on. And then if you raise social welfare rates and public service pay rates to what they are on the Republic, it would be 10% of Irish national income. And those are the base, base figures. Um, it, it, the, 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 to show what the effects of uh, some of the suggestions, if the interest payments on the share of the UK national debt were, uh, uh, if the UK uh, decided to absorb that, that would save uh, 1.4 percentage points. So the, the transfer would be, the subvention would be 4.4 percent of Irish national income, not 5.8. Or if the British continue to pay pensions in Northern Ireland um, while we collected the social insurance contributions, it would be 3.9 percent. So that's the, a, a, an idea as to the kind of areas of which uh, there is disagreement. On the national debt interest, uh, the payments um, uh, I, I show there, the Irish in 2019 was just over 2% of national income. Northern Ireland's share of UK interest was 0.8% of Irish national income or 3% of, of GDP in Northern Ireland. So that's what we're talking about. There are precedents for, for breaking up countries. Um, uh, West Virginia left Virginia in a, the 18, early 1860s and the US Supreme Court decided they had to pay in 2013, I think. When Ireland, uh, the Irish Free State accepted without too much demur a share of the UK national debt in 1922. It was written off in 1925 in return for giving up on Northern Ireland. And um, Czechoslovakia, break up, they shared the assets and liability. The USSR, when it broke up, they didn't have much in the way of liabilities, but they shared the assets. The Ukrainians got some of the embassies, actually. So that's the norm. It would be obviously subject to negotiation. But what you must remember is Scotland. If Scotland had voted for independence in 2014, was it? They would have taken a share of the UK national debt. The British government were determined on that. And the question is, if Scotland, if unification was happening before Scotland became independent, then they, from a British government point of view, there'd be an issue of setting precedent to give Ireland more generous terms than Scotland would be unwise from their point of view. And so what would apply for Northern Ireland um, could, could well be a precedent um, elsewhere. On the social insurance pensions, um, social insurance is a pay-as-you-go scheme. Actually, when Ireland became independent in 1922, there was the unemployment insurance scheme and there was no question of the UK continuing to pay for unemployment in Ireland and Ireland collecting the, the insurance contributions. So um, under United Ireland, um, we have assumed that the social insurance contributions will be collected in Dublin and the pensions will be paid within, within this jurisdiction, um, which would be uh, normal. The alternative assumption is that the United Ireland still collects the social insurance contributions in what is a pay-as-you-go scheme, while pensions are paid in the North by the UK. I think it's unlikely. Um, there, is a, there is the issue that if somebody works in Britain and works in Ireland and then retires in Ireland, the share of their time in Britain um, is the UK government pay for it. So there are precedents which were established in, I think, the early 1970s with free movement of labour. Um, uh, and the argument is apply those precedents today. But I think it's different if Northern Ireland leaves the United Kingdom, but you can make up your own mind on that. And remember the precedent for Scotland. If uh, uh, the United Kingdom may be happy to see Northern Ireland go, or some in the United Kingdom may be, but they would be much more concerned about seeing Scotland go. And Scotland is much bigger. So if you're really generous for Northern Ireland, it would be a huge hit if you gave the same terms to Scotland. Um, conclusions and subvention. Um, the, those who disagree with our headline numbers are assumed the UK would be very generous. I'm uh, given that Ireland is and probably still would be richer than uh, the United Kingdom. It seems unlikely that they would want to be very generous for, for, for indefinitely. <clears throat> 
thus the, uh, uh, which gives you the headline figure of 5% of Irish national income um, uh, uh, if it happened today. If welfare and wage rates were rapidly brought to Irish levels, this would add another 5%, taking you 10%, which is bigger uh, on an ongoing basis, which is bigger than the hit we suffered in the uh, financial crisis. Um, leaving Northern Ireland, uh, some have suggested, leave Northern Ireland indefinitely as the poor cousins with on lower welfare and pay rates. You might do that for a while, but if you're going for United Ireland to say have second class citizens in Northern Ireland, that's not, that's may have been the UK approach to Northern Ireland in the past. I don't think it would be sustainable in the long term. So the cost of 10% of GNI is it would be a huge hit. Um, looking at this, that's looking at it today. Um, at the macroeconomic implications of unification, the substitution of Dublin for London in paying the subvention would have a knock-on negative impact on the economy. The 5% coming from London disappears. The Rep Republic has to raise taxes or cut expenditure to pay for it, and there will be knock-on economic effects, which we have not taken account of. Finance actually estimate, I think Edgar has some figures on that. Um, uh, paying for re-rating social welfare and wage rates in the North would actually be a transfer from the people in the Republic to Northern Ireland. There would be no loss to the Irish economy. Um, people in Northern Ireland could end up better as a result, better off as a result of unification than people in the Republic. If the Republic had to pay the 10% uh, with all its knock-on effects and the Republic and Northern Ireland, you had re-rating of welfare and, and pensions. The Northern Ireland economy is very closely integrated into the UK economy. So breaking the link, we haven't done this analysis, would be have pretty dramatic effects on Northern Ireland initially and take some time to, pay, to, to play out. Of course, Northern Ireland becoming part of the EU single market for services as well as for goods and integrating, there would be benefits there. But in the early years, they're likely to be I think heavily offset by the dislocation. And then uh, once off cost to breaking the link with the UK and reorganizing Northern Ireland, but they would be once off costs, but they would be significant. Um, the problem is Northern Ireland's productivity is so low. And I think that the answer is for Northern Ireland to get on with making Northern Ireland work. Um, and if they do that and narrow the gap, then the cost of unification could be very much reduced. And the reason uh, why, a, 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 the primary reason for Northern Ireland's low productivity is the low human capital. The major problems with the educational system and the high proportion of the North's graduates who choose to live in England rather than in Northern Ireland. Um, I just, uh, to illustrate this, I show here uh, for the UK regions and Ireland, the share of early school leavers in the population. And Northern Ireland um, has the highest proportion of early school leavers of any region in the United Kingdom. The Republic is lower than anywhere else, any UK region. And in terms of uh, proportion of graduates, the North has the smallest share of graduates where uh, Ireland, London, and Scotland have, a, have, a, have the highest share. So that just illustrates the legacy effects of poor, poor educational system. And I just show here the share of the population in England and Wales aged 15 to 64. And um, if you look at the second last line for Ireland, 8% of our graduates were living there. 24% of Northern Ireland graduates um, are, are, were living there. So that is the problem. They're leaking at both ends of the system. Um, and the reason for the very high cost of unification is the productivity gap. If Northern Ireland made a dramatic change in its educational system today, in 30, 25, 30 years time, you would see the effects and narrowing the productivity gap. It takes a long time. As we discovered, we improved our educational system in 1967. The Celtic Tiger was the 1990s. Northern Ireland needs to integrate the grammar and secondary schools and stop failing 60% of children at the age of 11. That's where you get these very high early school leaver problem. It's a big problem. Um, Middle-class parents, your kids get into grammar school and all of them go on to university. It's great if you're a middle-class parent. And the work by Seamus McGuinness shows actually that in the Republic, uh, working class kids have a reasonable chance of making it into the middle classes. In Northern Ireland, you will end up where your parents were because of the education system. And a quicker win would be to bring back the North's graduates, but you've got to persuade them that Northern Ireland is the place to be. Edgar. So I think this this issue of convergence actually um this this issue of convergence is 
is it's okay it's is one of those that has come up quite a bit and in fact uh, some people make an assumption that somehow or another uh, northern ireland is going to uh, to converge to the living standards we have down here that productivity is going to grow um john mentions also infrastructure a bit which is something that i have published on in the past and of course improving the infrastructure is going to come at a cost we didn't include that in our analysis but you might ask, um, what is, you know, what's the chance of Northern Ireland actually converging? Um, we we know that productivity in Northern Ireland is lower than uh, down here, um, and we also know that some people in their commentary on our work have said, well, that that productivity is just going to grow faster in in the north. Um, there actually is a very, very extensive literature, in fact, uh, in, in, in regional science circles, that's one of the principal topics of research for decades. I just mentioned a couple of uh, papers, and it is possible to, to summarize that literature, or one can do a, a quick look at actual data, which is what I'm going to do here now. And I'm gonna look at Ireland, Germany, and the whole of the EU, and look at the convergence experience uh, uh, that we have seen over the last 20 years, uh, and in some cases you can go back further. So if you if you take Northern Ireland as it is now, um, let's assume there is a, a United Ireland, uh, then the GDP of Northern Ireland and the GNI of the Republic of Ireland together make up our national income. And we can look at the per capita national income in Northern Ireland relative to that new uh, average in United Ireland. And it turns out it's a roughly 25% uh, lower than the national average. And so Northern Ireland actually drags down our, our average uh, uh, per capita national income. So the question then is, are there regions in the EU that have been 25% behind and have converged over a reasonable period. Uh, we look at 20 years here. And we have that data, so we can look at this. And it turns out that of the 498 EU nuts tree regions there, uh, uh, like our regional assembly uh, um, uh, or regional authority regions, uh, 498 were 25% behind in 2000. Uh, by 2019, not a single one of them managed to get to the re respective national average. Um, two managed it by 2021, that's the latest data, uh, one in Northern Bavaria and one in Portugal. And in that case, it looks like the transfers uh, uh, that came about during COVID actually pushed them up to the national average. The, the number of lagging regions, regions that are actually below the national average GDP per capita in the EU has actually increased. And if you look at country by country, the majority of countries in the EU actually have divergence. In other words, the poorer countries are getting relatively poorer rather than relatively richer. So that's the EU. Um, if we look at Germany, and again, German unification is often uh, brought up when it comes to uh, an example for what might uh, or might not happen in, in, in the case of Irish unification. And obviously, unification is that is the, is the kind of word that, that joins these. Uh, it turns out, of course, that there are huge differences between uh, what happened with, with East Germany to what might happen in the case of an Irish unification. But again, we can look at the regions within Germany and see whether East Germany as a whole has converged. And again, I'm going to 2000 uh, and look at the most recent data. And in the year 2000, uh, East Germany was 35% uh, uh, behind the national average GDP per capita. And that has increased, uh, depends where you, where, which year you use, but it's gone to, to just over 70%. So there's been some convergence, but they haven't gone to 100%, nowhere near. Okay. So this is far from complete, the convergence. And one has to remember that 
there has been a huge cost, and this has been counted in Germany. Uh, the specific uh, uh, unification funds that existed amount to something close to 2 trillion euros. That's not counting some of the other regional uh, transfers that go on in Germany anyway, that have been also going on uh, in West Germany before. So that's uh, Germany, okay? No convergence. We can also look at Ireland. And as John said, uh, you know, human capital, uh, higher education is one thing that explains why Ireland has very high productivity. And within Ireland, of course, we have one education system. So did the change in the education system back in the 60s lift all boats in, in terms of regions? So we can look at GDP. And what you find is rather than convergence at the regional level, you find divergence. That's despite uh, all regions in Ireland having the same education system, the same corporation tax rate, etc. Now, you might say GDP is a terrible measure for Ireland. True. Uh, we don't have an equivalent of GNI at the regional level. Well, we can look at personal incomes. And that's a, that's a true measure. That's not distorted by any foreign uh, direct investment or anything else. And we actually have that at county level, that data. Again, if you look at it, uh, there is no evidence of convergence. In fact, there is evidence of divergence. And that's despite there being a fairly significant uh, redistribution through the long distance commuting we have as well. So people in West Meath in the Midlands, which is one of the poorer regions, do benefit from commuting into Dublin and bringing their income back. Uh, so the evidence, and this is totally consistent with the international li literature, uh, is that regions that are poorer don't tend to converge. The convergence ones are the exception rather than the rule. So I think it's rather heroic to assume that somehow magically Northern Ireland is going to uh, converge and have higher productivity simply because we change the status of the border. Uh, and in fact, if one looks at regions that have done well, in each case, there have been very substantial costs to achieving that. We did not take account of those costs in our analysis. So if you want to have a convergence story, you want to also have to deal with how much it's going to cost to achieve that. Okay, conclusions. Um, so we only looked at the direct uh, uh, costs of subvention. We, we don't make any assumptions about uh, the wider economic effects. Uh, they're actually quite, quite complicated to estimate, and one can do that, but one would need to know more about what Northern Ireland and, and what United Ireland might look like. And that's one of the things that in the whole debate, and, and there's been plenty of debate uh, in recent times about these numbers, uh, the one thing I miss is any detail about what people actually want a United Ireland to look like. And it's very reminiscent. And again, I've stood here on this platform a couple of times talking about Brexit and have done a lot of work on Brexit. It strikes me that uh, some of the people uh, who are most fervent for uh, United Ireland have the least, uh, have, have put forward really nothing about the detail of what they want it to look like. That's a bit like Brexit. Uh, oh, let's do it. It's great. It's going to be great, uh, but we can't give you any detail. And I think it's it's uh, important that we do get to this detail. If we had, I mean, our numbers essentially, because we're looking at 2019, we're essentially looking at a unification pretty much in the near term. Uh, I'm not sure how likely that is or not, but we do that because we have actual data. Okay, We're using existing published data rather than making up some future which no, none of us know. Okay, um, There are things that can be done and uh, you know the, the issue of human capital and education I think is one of those that is really, really striking in the Irish convergence uh, uh, experience. And fixing some of these issues in Northern Ireland is going to help Northern Ireland, whether there's a unification or not. 
but it would certainly reduce the cost of unif unification. Um, so there, there are some wider issues that we, again, have not considered. There's definitely a difference between Belfast and, say, Fermanagh. Uh, and so you may see that Belfast might do very well in a unification scenario, but other parts of Northern Ireland don't. Again, that's something that's, uh, you know, spe you could speculate about it. We didn't put it into our analysis because we want to stick to, to the sort of facts we have right now. And I leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank <music> you.